Well, good morning, friends. Uh, welcome this morning. My name is Mark Ernji, and I'm one of the ministers here on faculty at Moore Theological College. And it's my uh, great privilege this Thursday morning to welcome uh, you and uh, my esteemed colleague, David Honey, as he continues to deliver uh, these 43rd annual Moore College lectures for 2021. Now, I uh, trust that if you've been listening to the lectures from the last few days, uh, that you will have found uh, Dr. Honey's description of the triune God and the choosing self as uh, stimulating and thought-provoking as I have. Undoubtedly, uh, we've been taken on an important theological journey. Uh, we've begun our adventure uh, by considering what happens when God's choice of Jesus confronts the modern choosing self. That was last week, Thursday. We've traversed the lofty Trinitarian terrain by uh, covering what it might mean for the Lord Jesus Christ to be God's choice for himself. That was Monday. We have uh, uh, caught sight of the Satan and surveyed sin as envy Tuesday, and we've rested in reconciliation, the reconciliation wrought by our Redeemer, the Lord Christ. That was yesterday. But now this morning, now our exploration continues onwards and we might say upwards as we look at the resurrection, ascension and various other aspects of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. But before proceeding, let me make a few housekeeping comments. Uh, firstly, there's an outline for this lecture uh, available by clicking on the uh, download handout link which sits underneath this video uh, on the website. Uh, secondly, you'll also see a uh, Slido, S-L-I.D-O, link there as well, a little button just under this video. This button will take you to another page where you could submit questions during the lecture and at the end of David's paper, I'll select some of those questions and repeat them for Dr Honey to answer for us. And thirdly and lastly, uh, these lectures are being recorded, so they'll be available for viewing uh, afterwards. Um, you, you may, as I have, feel the need to revisit uh, an aspect of these uh, more College lectures. You might need a few moments just to slow down and electronically ponder some of the sights, sounds and sentences again that you may have missed along the way. Uh, but at any rate, uh, before David comes to present today's lecture, I'll read from the Holy Scriptures and I'll lead us in a time of prayer. Our reading from the Scriptures this morning comes from the book of Acts, chapter 2, from verse 17 all the way to the end of verse 33. <clears throat> Acts chapter 2, from verse 17. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days and they will prophesy. <clears throat> I'll show wonders in the heaven above and signs of the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to this. <clears throat> Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God to you by miracles, wonders and signs, which God did among you through him, as you yourselves know. This man was handed over to you by God's set purpose and foreknowledge. And you, with the help of wicked men, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. My body also will live in hope 
because you will not abandon me to the grave, nor will you let your Holy One see decay. You have made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. Brothers, I can tell you confidently that the patriarch David died and was buried and his tomb is here to this day. But he was a prophet and knew that God had promised him on oath that he would place one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing what was ahead, he spoke of the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to the grave, nor did his body see decay. God has raised this Jesus to life, and we are all witnesses of the fact. Exalted to the right hand of God, he has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, and has poured out what you now see and hear. Lord God, you declare your almighty power, chiefly in showing mercy and pity to your people. Grant us such a measure of your grace that, strengthened by your Holy Spirit and running in the way of your commands, we may take hold of your promises and share in your heavenly treasure through Jesus Christ, our crucified, risen, and ascended Lord. Amen. Good morning again, everyone. Welcome back to the uh, increasingly fuzzy annual Moore College lectures. My wife commented that... Uh, my hair might need some doing as I got ready this morning, but I thought, well, for the sake of uh, the audience at home who are no doubt lamenting the uh, lack of hairdressers, uh, just go with whatever came up today. I was reading an article recently discussing the possibilities of combining Marxist socialism with a market economy. What caught my eye was a comment from Marx himself decrying crude communism that reflects capitalism's economy of envy. Capitalism, according to Marx, uses envy to motivate people to raise themselves up in terms of wealth, whereas crude communism results when socialism used envy to drag everyone down. I quote from Marx himself, how little this abolition of private property represents a genuine communism is shown by the abstract negation of the whole world of culture and civilization, and to the regression to the unnatural simplicity of the poor and wantless individual who's not only surpassed but not yet attained to it. That's from private property. Now, I suspect Rousseau and the Romantics like him would have had some difficulties with Marx's definition here, at least in terms of the presumably possessionless ideal that re is required for a natural man without society. Either way, I think the history will show that a fair number of Marxist revolutions that contributed to international socialism began at least in this crude fashion, not just Pol Pot's attack on Cambodia, as the author of the article acknowledged. Certainly, as far as the choosing self is concerned in the contemporary Twitter sphere, eat the rich usually refers to eat those who are richer than me. The culture of uniformity or fairness that emerges in such a space has no room for grace or mercy, since these actions represent some kind of relational favour or asymmetry. And asymmetric relationships are against the grain and must be resisted. Since last Thursday, I've been offering a very long qualification of my answer to a question that I posed. What happens when God's choice of Jesus confronts the choosing self? On Monday, I qualified what I meant by God's choice of Jesus that God the Father has chosen to create a world through and for his beloved Son, Christ Jesus, who is the Lord. Borrowing from Bonhoeffer, I propose that in his choice of Messiah Jesus, as the Lord the Father offers the choosing self a share in his reality at the same time as the reality of the world is on offer. 
since all things hold together in the Lord Jesus Christ. On Tuesday, I changed focus to consider from a theological point of view what the choosing self's reaction is to the offer that the Father grants in his Messiah, Jesus. As Paul describes it, the choosing self is alienated from the Father and hostile in its intentions towards his beloved Son. So hostile, in fact, that the fruit of the choosing self's alienation is envy towards the choice of Jesus as Lord. Yet the envy towards the Son that we explored in the Gospel accounts is simply the climax of a long story of envy towards the sovereign choice of the Father for his Son. Of course, the long story of envy does come to its climax at the cross, and so yesterday we investigated the mystery of the Father's will towards the choosing self. The Father chooses to have his image and firstborn desecrated and deposed, He gives the choosing self over to vent its envy in all its hostile and evil fury. Yet out of his pleasure in the Father and in the power of the Spirit, the royal son submits to death on a cross. As he does, we discover that all the fullness of God, his presence and action, are at work propitiating wrath and expiating sin in the bodily form of the crucified Messiah. What is more, the Father is reconciled to the world as his Son is enthroned on the cross in his royal heavenly glory. The Lord saves from Golgotha. At the cross, all the envy of the choosing self is exhausted as the self-absorbed and self-deceived attempt to rid themselves of any challenge to their will to power. It is both Jew and Gentile conspire together against the Lord's anointed, seeking to turn him into a lurid caricature of the power they idolatry worship, idolatrously worship. God's wrath is poured out on this and every other kind of sin that stems from it. In this way, God chooses the conditions for the possibility of forgiveness from sin, release from death, and victory over evil. These conditions are perfected, of course, when in the Spirit the Father raised his Messiah from the dead. As I mentioned last Thursday, if the choosing self wants revolutionary new beginnings, then there is none like the resurrection of Christ Jesus from the dead. Our habit has been to begin our meditations from Colossians 1, and so this morning I'll begin with Colossians 1, verse 18, Here we see a special refinement of Paul's description of the one who is before all things and in whom all things hold together. At the outset of the week, I argued that the beloved son portrayed in this passage should be understood as the exalted Messiah of Psalm 110. The mention of his resurrection in the context gives me the opportunity to segue to the Pentecost account that uh, uh, Dr. Ernji read for us so that I can talk about the institution of the church in the person of the exalted son and the outpouring of the spirit in the same event that enables the father to constitute a church as the body of Messiah Jesus. (coughs) So the image bearer vindicated as firstborn. The Feast of Pentecost heralds the last days of the old order of creation that begin with a public vindication of the desecrated and deposed image bearer and firstborn. The longer story of the Father's agency in the Spirit for and through the Son begins a new chapter as the ascended Messiah is revealed to be the agent through whom the Father has achieved the reconciliation of all things in anticipation of their perfection in a new creation. The meaning of Jesus' headship over the church rests on the Spirit's work of raising him from the dead, lifting him to the right hand of the Father's throne in the heavenlies and constituting the church. As Peter said, God has resurrected this Jesus. We're all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he's been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. Amid all the excitement and noise, 
the rushing wind, tongues of flame and foreign languages. Amidst the gathering throng, Peter explains that the truly spectacular thing about Pentecost is that the last days of the old order have begun with the vindication of the crucified Jesus as none other than the long-promised Messiah of God, the Saviour of the world. Jesus went to Golgotha crowned with thorns while the peoples plotted in vain and the rulers conspired together against the Lord and his anointed one. Defied and defiled, the king of the Jews is ex executed as an insurrectionist and in the company of the same. In Acts 2, it's been 50 days since Jesus was publicly executed and the disciples all went into hiding, assuming the worst, that their Lord was dead and all was lost. Since then, of course, in the power of the Spirit, Jesus rose from the dead and presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them over a period of 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God, as we're told in Acts chapter 1, verse 3. More recently, in the Acts narrative, Jesus was taken up as they were watching and a cloud took him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven. That's Acts 1, 9 and 10. At Pentecost, the Spirit enables Peter and the others to grasp the significance of all the events they've experienced up to this point. At the same time, the agency of the Messiah in the Spirit now takes on an explicitly transcendent character as the Messiah baptises a specific group with the Spirit and with fire. We'll consider both aspects of the Spirit's agency in turn, but first, let's take a deep breath. I was going to say today's Zoom stretch should be something like this, although considering how uh, little exercise I've had, it might be something more like this. But my good wife... Uh, reminded me we should do something more like this, the interconnectedness that stretches forth. So let us consider Jesus as Lord and Messiah in the power of the Spirit. In the power of the Spirit, Jesus is raised to life and at Pentecost, Peter proclaims that this resurrection has vindicated the faith of Jesus through Psalm 16. That is... Jesus of Nazareth, in the words of Psalm 16, went to the cross that he would not be abandoned to Hades, that the Father would not let his Holy One see decay. Rather, the paths of lives filled with gladness in the Father's presence were his hope revealed to him. More specifically, perhaps, Jesus' thrice-uttered prophecy made en route to Jerusalem, he will be raised, raised up or resurrected on the third day, has been fulfilled. Consequently, and in addition, Peter cites Psalm 110 in reference to the risen Jesus. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool. Jesus himself has alluded to this psalm in reference to himself. And on, the basis, on this basis of Pentecost, Peter argues that it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but rather God has made this Jesus whom you crucified, Lord and Messiah. As Messiah, Jesus is the Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Christ Jesus is the one who, when questioned about his identity by Moses, the Lord answered, I will be who I will be. And he is Messiah Jesus. The events of that Pentecost are a sign that the Messiah has taken up his promised office of universal ruler. All the Psalms, like Psalm 89, promised for a relationship between God and his anointed king. All those promises have been perfected in the spirit and for the resurrection of Jesus. Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of your kingdom is a scepter of justice, we read in Psalm 45. The heavenly reign of God is now at the right hand or is now the right of Messiah Jesus twice vindicated. And as the writer to the Hebrews says, after making purification for sin, he sat down at the right hand of the Messiah on high. Now starts his divine rule. The deposed king is not merely restored to an earthly monarchy, but is in fact 
exalted far above all thrones and powers to be recognised as God's firstborn over all nations and, in fact, all creation. Christ Jesus, who worshipped God alone as his patron, has been vindicated against the envy of the Satan. There is no kneeling for the Son of God, but rather sitting at the right hand of glory. The narrative tension between the promises of God that Mary's son would sit on the throne of David forever and the faith of the Messiah to the point of death has been resolved such that the royal covenant has been fulfilled. The Holy One of Israel rules through the Son of the Most High and in the power of his Holy Spirit forever. Peter's testimony at Pentecost in particular, his pronouncement in Acts 2.36 was another opportunity for Arius' followers to pounce on the possibility of the person of the Eternal Son to be constituted in an act of the Father's will. God made Jesus Lord, says uh, Acts 2. Now, in the third, second uh, discourse against the uh, Arians, Athanasius responded as he has in a number of places by insisting that any language that could be conceived of creating, making, forming, when used in the context of the Father being the agent, must, in relation to the Son, refer to the flesh assumed by the Word in the Incarnation. Acts 2.36 can't be a statement to the effect that the Father created the Lord Jesus, or even that the man Jesus was adopted into divinity, since there's no scriptural precedent for the idea that God made himself a son or created himself a word or that the word is a work of creation, writes Athanasius against the Arians in uh, Discourse 2, Part 11. After all, Athanasius adds, for Peter, after saying he hath made Lord and Christ, straightway added, this Jesus whom ye crucified, which makes it plain to anyone that not the essence of the word, but he according to his manhood is said to have been made. The risen Jesus of Nazareth is revealed or manifested as the Lord and this towards us, says the bishop, for by the signs and wonders which the Lord did, he was manifested to be not merely man, but God in a body and Lord also, the Christ. Now, of course, Jesus of Nazareth as the word made flesh was always Lord and Messiah, being both the Emmanuel and the son of David. It as is also the case, and especially at the cross, the presence of the only begotten son was concealed in the actions of the royal son and made accessible only in his relations to the Father. Nevertheless, the perfecting work of the Spirit of Pentecost is continuous with his work throughout the ministry of the royal son, and that is revealing his glory as the only begotten son of the Father. What is more, as Athanasius points out, he is made Lord as the risen Christ for us, as Psalm 45 verse 3, Psalm 45 verse 3 says, the Lord became a refuge for the oppressed. In the exalted Messiah we have the true image of God to deliver us from false worship and corruption, so that as the Messiah he might perfectly mediate the rule of the Lord, and as the Lord he might save his people from their enemies as the perfect kinsman redeemer. For it is fitting, I'm quoting here again, for it was fitting that the redemption should take place through none other than him who is the Lord by nature, lest through, lest though created by the Son, we should name another Lord and fall into the Aryan or Greek folly, serving the creature beyond the all-creating God. Finally, the pouring out of the Spirit of Pentecost is therefore the appropriate means of sanctifying the flesh of others that he has taken for himself. Now, as you can see from the words of Peter on the screen, the outpouring of the Spirit of Pentecost is critical to the Lordship of the Messiah, that he is the mediator of divine rule from the right hand, as Messiah David foresaw. The agency of the Lord in the power of his spirit is foundational to an Old Testament understanding of God as creator in Genesis 1, Psalm 33 and Psalm 104, just to name a few instances. Moreover, as I mentioned on Monday, it is critical to any understanding that a word has been spoken by God. It is the Holy Spirit of God that brings the word of the Lord to and through the prophets to distinguish them from any other man of God or false prophet. 
In fact, from Ezekiel 37, it is the breath or spirit of the Lord that anticipates the possibility of the resurrection in the first place. I agree wholeheartedly with Athanasius' remarks to the Arians warning against Pentecost being a sign of adoptionism, that the Father made Jesus Lord in the Spirit by his ascension. Nevertheless, we do need to recognise a dynamic change in the narrative from the way that the Spirit of the Father works in and for the Messiah to the way that the Father works through the Messiah in the Spirit as Lord. Arguably, the Spirit's agency at Pentecost is on par with the power that the Messiah exhibited when he fed the people in the wilderness and distinguished himself as greater than Moses in John chapter 6. Now, throughout the 4th century, the Nicene Fathers struggled to articulate a belief that the Spirit of the Lord was very God in the same way that the Son is very God. The challenge is obvious at one level since the Father and Son both have personal names and the Spirit doesn't. Consequently, the Arians raised all manner of objections suggesting that the Spirit must be a brother of the Son or even a grandson of the Father, all of which Athanasius and the Cappadocians refuted in various works. Nevertheless, as you can see in your handout, Athanasius still pulled his punches when it came to attributing the status of very God to the Spirit. Basil of Caesarea was similar and in fact Baer points out that Gregory Nazianzen was unsuccessful to get the phrase included in the Constantinople Creed. Athanasius's language doesn't help with the charge of modalism and would have benefited from a more attention to Irenaeus that we've seen that he was all ready to give. On Monday we saw that he was prepared to speak of the word as the hand of God He needs only admit that the Father acts in creation through his two hands and there would have been conceptual parity. Of course, his argument was in a situation in which his opponents accepted that the Son was homoousios with the Father, so Athanasius argued that the Spirit was the same as the Son. What we can see then at Pentecost is what Basil of Caesarea was later to uh, describe as the perfecting work of the Spirit being done from the Father and through the Son. As we can see from the words of Peter on the screen, the outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost is critical to the Lordship of the Messiah, that he is the mediator of divine rule from the right hand as Messiah David foresaw. The agency of the Lord in the power of the Spirit is foundational. Oh, sorry. I've just realised a a slight technical glitch here. Uh, I have two copies of the same slide. We're bound to have this sort of thing. Let me try and go on. Ah. The outpouring of the Spirit at Pentecost vindicates Messiah Jesus as firstborn over all creation and in the process announces the perfection of the Father's promise to create a people for himself. Since the time of Abraham, God's intentions have always been for more than a single family, or at least the nature of the family that God is gathering is more than genetic, as we see in Galatians 3.14. Hence, in the New Testament, the people of God are distinguished, even from Israel, by the Spirit as the Church of Jesus the Christ. In fact, the Spirit constitutes the church as those who are the body of the Messiah, the head. And so we read at Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit had enabled them. We read they were all gathered in one place. The they here is most likely the 120 mentioned in chapter 1. This group consists of at least 11 apostles plus Matthias and Jesus' mother and brothers. As mentioned above, they are gathered for the Feast of Pentecost. Then comes the moment of spectacular. The rushing of wind, the appearance of flames and special speech. The critical thing to notice here is that a distinct group has been formed compared to all the other God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. As the Father pours out the gift of his Spirit, the church is formed from these Jews from every nation under heaven, we're told. 
The Spirit constitutes the church and this group, this family, is very different from any other because the normal, ordinary or natural divisions between people no longer determine access to God's promises, as in Galatians 3.28. Both Isaiah 43 and Ezekiel 36 were enabled by the Spirit to anticipate the democratisation of the Spirit's activity amongst God's people. In fact, God promised a universal character to the agency of his Spirit amongst humanity through the prophet Joel, who foresaw the Spirit being poured out on all flesh. Let's just take a deep breath and a quick zoom stretch while I uh, struggle with my own... uh, gremlins in the software here. What matters is the work of the Spirit in uniting the church around Jesus the Christ, particularly faith in the forgiveness of sin that comes through him. Peter tells the crowds, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Repent and be baptised, every one of you, in the name of Jesus the Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the promised Holy Spirit. The Spirit unites people to each other through faith in Christ Jesus, faith in the forgiveness of sins that comes only through him. It is at the same time a foundational antidote for envy that so characterised the story of sin in the Bible. The primary reason for humans to abandon envy between each other is the fact that they have been forgiven by the Father for envying his choice of Jesus to be their ruler. The agency of the Spirit in them is to produce a new heart, said Ezekiel, one no longer turned in upon itself, but upwards and outwards in the power of the Spirit towards the Father. Now, this happens twice more in spectacular fashion in the Acts story, and both these occasions focus on the activity of the Spirit. Sometime later in chapter 8, Philip speaks to the Samaritans about Jesus, and the Spirit unites the Samaritans to the church in Jerusalem. And so we read, when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them. After they went down there, they prayed for them so that the Samaritans might receive the Holy Spirit because he had not yet come down on any of them. Then Peter and John laid hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. The ancient division between northern and southern kingdoms in Israel is healed in a single moment as the Samaritans, who were otherwise despised by the Jews, received the same spirit of Christ. All with it, the spirit leads to envy being put to death amongst them. Lastly, in Acts 10, Peter goes to the Gentiles in Joppa and thanks to the work of the spirit, even the Gentiles are constituted into the church. From Acts 10, Peter began to speak. I now realise how true it is that God does not show favouritism, but accepts from every nation the one who fears him and does what is right. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. Back to Pentecost, Peter appealed to Joel 2, 38, 28 to 32, which looked forward to the Lord blessing his people, in fact, all people, with his spirit. The Acts story gives this a particular ordering through as first in Jerusalem, then Samaria, and finally in Gentile Joppa, a people of the spirit identified and distinguished from the sons of Israel throughout the rest of the Acts narrative. By the time we get to Cornelius story in Acts chapter 10, we have the one new man of whom Paul will write about in Ephesians 2, 14 to 16. The Spirit constitutes the church by uniting people simply on the basis of faith in the promise of forgiveness that comes through the death of Jesus. So far, so good, perhaps, through the exalted Lord Jesus and in the perfecting work of the Spirit, The Father constitutes a new people who were otherwise alienated from him and from each other, diaspora Jews, Samaritans and Gentiles. Yet this is more than an exercise in globalisation, something that the capitalist part of the choosing self loves, nor is it a primitive version of international socialism. When the Spirit constitutes the Church as the body of Christ, this group is caught up in the Father's promise to create a people for himself. 
They're intended to be the fulfilment of the promise that God made to Abraham. Through Christ Jesus and in the Spirit, they inherit one of the most basic promises in the whole Bible. I will be your God and you shall be my people. On Monday, I argued that since the world has been made so that the Father could exalt his messianic son as Lord, then the creatureliness with which the world consists was the kind that would, fit, would be fit to participate in God's choice for himself. Through his Son and in his Spirit, the Father has made the man and the woman in the likeness of his image bearer, but they resented and rebelled against God's sovereign will and made their own images in the world. Now that the Father has reconciled the world to himself by installing his beloved Son as Lord to be the firstborn in the power of the Spirit, this promise can be perfected. Yet when the Father confronts the choosing self with such a people of promise, the dynamics of his humanity will be governed by the relationship revealed between the Father and his messianic Son in the Spirit. We're going to come back uh, and uh, consider that more closely uh, after the break, but for now... Stand up, do your Zoom stretch, and we'll come back together in uh, five minutes' time. Last Thursday, as I described the syndrome of the choosing self, I noted that one of the clusters of symptoms in the syndrome was capitalism. In this system of free exchange based on the self-interest of participants produces a concept of freedom that is, at all times seeking distance from the constraints of others unless some mutually agreed benefit can be established for the parties involved. The idea of a society as a collection of people directing their wills towards a particular purpose is as old as Aristotle, the main alternative being a community in which those involved simply will to be what they are, that is, in the case of a family. You don't have to do anything to be a family, you just are. As described last Thursday, the Romantics intended to educate the citizenry to enhance their bildung. This was the individual's aspirational self-portrait that was, nevertheless, a matter of each aesthetic individual expressing something of the living force of things themselves. The consequence of such a combination of the will to purpose with the will to be, especially with the cult of genius, genius and the rise of nationalism, led to the logical extreme of Nietzsche's will to power, the Übermensch, otherwise known in the early 20th century as the fascist dictator. Fascism was by no means the only outcome of modern culture, nor the most egregious aspect of it as far as some romantics were concerned. The phenomenon of fashions that drive consumer culture were a chief contributor to later romantic concepts of personal authenticity, So Heidegger describes mass society in its inconspicuousness and unascertainability, the real dictatorship is of the they unfolding. We take pleasure and enjoy ourselves as they take pleasure. We read, see and judge about literature and art as they see and judge. We find shocking what they find shocking. The they, which which all are, prescribes the kind of being of our everydayness. Now, until it became commodified, authenticity was the decision to avoid living like this. All this notwithstanding, what kind of life community is the body of Christ as constituted in the spirit according to the will of the Father? Now, because of Pentecost and the ascension of the Lord Jesus, the eschatological future of the world has been brought to us So we are, as I have argued in other places, in the middle, living between the resurrection and the return of the Lord Jesus. The Pentecost, with all its spectacular phenomena, echoes one of the great God-speaking events, Sinai, where God appeared in the midst of cloud, voices and torches and thick cloud and fire, we read in Exodus 19, thanks to Greg Beale. In addition, the phrase tongues of fire appears in Isaiah 30, where Yahweh descends upon his holy mountain and is cloaked with dense smoke, his tongues like consuming fire, again observed by Greg Beale. Furthermore, within this scene of divine imminence, the disciples are described as filled with the Holy Spirit. Here the disciples are individually touched by and baptised with the Spirit as both John the baptizer and Jesus had promised. In fact, the Spirit rests upon them as he did with Jesus. 
This is not to say the flame is the spirit any more than the dove was for Jesus at the Jordan. Nevertheless, the language of these verses equates easily with the imminent intervention or action by the spirit upon an individual. The story certainly mentions that the disciples were enabled by the spirit to speak in other languages. In fact, through reference to the Joel prophecy, Peter explains to the gathered crowd that the outpouring of the Spirit constitutes a people who speak or testify to the resurrected Jesus as the choice of God for the world. As the Lord himself said, the main theme of the Acts account is the testimony of the apostles spreading from Jerusalem to the ends of the earth. The share in the reality of God and the world that comes through Christ begins with testimony to God's choice of him as Lord and Messiah. In this way, the Spirit turns envy immediately into exaltation. The Spirit's priority for testimony to the Christ is evident even once the church begins to be domesticated in the ordinary patterns of human life. The apostles are the eyewitnesses to the Lord, the ones specially taught by him in the 40 days between his resurrection and ascension. We've already learnt that in the story that they are especially empowered by the Spirit to testify to Jesus. They are the expert interpreters, interpreters of the seminal texts of the tradition, as uh, Alasdair MacIntyre refers to it. The agency of the Spirit in them ensures that their testimony is included with the rest of Scripture, even after their death, as the word of the Lord to us. At the same time, the Spirit also provides the community with the leadership that it is at once guided and governed by apostolic authority, subject to it, and yet similarly empowered for testimony, as we see in the stories of Stephen and Philip. Even when Paul subsequently enumerates various lists of gifts, services or ministries, the Father's action in the Spirit will make testimony to Christ central to the constituting work of the Spirit. It won't be a church without Christ at the centre. On that note, we should turn to 1 Corinthians to reflect on Paul's longest exploration of the agency of the Spirit in the body of Christ. Far removed from and far more domesticated than the Pentecost church, the agency of the Spirit to constitute the body of Christ is still basic to life for the church in Corinth. Nevertheless, in keeping with the Acts narrative, access to Christ and the Spirit is uniform despite culturally established divisions. For we're all baptised by one Spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free. Paul's exploration of the subject in chapter 2 has a specific agenda addressing a church with power issues. My focus here is on the manner in which the acts of the Father through Christ and in the Spirit establishes a pattern of life in the church, especially if we consider the importance of envy that I raised on Tuesday. As far as specific demonstrations of the Spirit are concerned, I will only say that I don't think the list are meant to be exhaustive, They're described with a certain subjunctive tone and it would be unwise to assume that they necessarily described acts that could not be done by individuals not blessed with the Spirit. Critical in this, in any other instance, is the mode in which human agency is powered by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of serving Christ Jesus. I note also that whatever other modes of human agency the Spirit will affect, apostolic testimony is still given priority. At the risk of over-exegeting an analogy, the first characteristic of the manner in which the spirit constitutes life in the body concerns individual engagement. The consistent message of the apostolic witness both here in Corinth and elsewhere is that through Christ, access to the promises of God is therefore membership in the body. It's both uniform and universal. Consequently, the agency of the spirit is to ensure that any who come to Christ can do some can do so with some opportunity to contribute to the body. Conversely, envy ought not to keep one separate from the body if the spirit is active. In practical terms, this is certainly a challenge for a local manifestation of the body, but should nevertheless give the community pause for thought. If nothing else, the extent to which the body of Christ has been overshadowed by the will to purpose 
or characterised by a narrow focus that results in the main thing being the only thing, the more opportunity it will be to create for envy to result in abstention. They don't need me. Again, treating the analogy lightly, we see that a complementary characteristic of the spirit's agency in constituting the body and guarding against envy greatly limits the reasons for which an individual might be excluded from the body. Paul talks about that more uh, precisely earlier on in Corinthians and it revol revolves around uh, faithfulness to Christ. But to the extent that the church is constituted by the spirit as distinct from the zeitgeist, the will of the Father is that the body of Christ reflect the widest range of ability to contribute. Whatever weakness or lack of honour might represent in a particular context, the agency of the Spirit should enable the community not only to foster interdependence, but accept and value any asymmetries that might result. This too has great potential to alleviate envy amongst God's people. The church's polity is governed by eschatological virtues, since these three, faith, hope and love, are the ones that remain. As such, it exists as a counter-testimony to the homogenising forces of globalisation as a community whose membership is not a matter of Jew or Greek or male or female or slave or free. For any who exhibit the mindset of the spirit are constituted as one in Christ. Likewise, the church must exist in contrast to the segregating powers of consumerism, where the rich are given priority over the poor, as James tells us in chapter 2. Considering that the grace of our Lord Jesus was to become poor because of you, even though he was rich, so that in his poverty you might become rich. The promise of God's perfecting work in the church is the possibility of a genuine common unity instituted in Christ on the one hand and on the other a concrete diversity constituted by the Spirit. Personhood, or at the very least identity, is the product of dynamic and mutual constitution between the members. We have our identity, our personhood, in, with and through each other. In the Spirit, Christ Jesus, the Head, gives freedom to his members to live and be who and what he has made them to be, for where the Spirit is, there is freedom. And here we observe the particular grace, the particular divine grace uh, exercised or in the agency of the Spirit, and that is to give freedom to others in relationship. The most basic form of bodily life that is nevertheless willed by the Father to be shaped through Christ and in the Spirit is a marriage with the consequence of children. I'm speaking mostly from the perspective of how these relationships are represented in the household codes in texts like Colossians, which has been our base and, of course, more fulsomely in passages like Ephesians 5. I'll attempt to make more concerted remarks about the unmarried tomorrow when my attention returns to the choosing self as an individual. But for the time being, though, the Father's choice of Christ Jesus as Lord and Messiah that is revealed in the Spirit's perfecting work directs one of the most basic forms of human embodiment towards that end, that is, man and woman embodiment together. Just as Adam was a form of the one to come as the likeness of the image bearer, and Eve too, so also man and woman together is constituted in the Spirit's testimony towards the perfection of humanity in the revelation of Christ and the Church. Their joining together of their flesh in the perfecting work of the Spirit is for the purpose of testifying to marriage between Christ and the Church, with the prospect that in a new creation the original institution will be superseded and therefore not required. The dynamics of their life together has been eschatologically transformed to an image of divine life, as Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 11. The threefold form of divine grace that I've mentioned as revealed in the Gospel, initiative, response and freedom, is variously applied in the context of the Father and Christ in 1 Corinthians 11 and Christ in the Church in Ephesians 5. Now, importantly... 
maleness and femaleness, that essential uh, ingredient of humanity, itself is not eclipsed nor discounted, but rather redirected from the creation mandate to the perfected reign of the true image bearer and firstborn. So consequently, as Paul indicates in 1 Corinthians 7, not entering into marriage has equal validity for the purpose of serving Christ. The critical issue is that embodiment, whether male or female, is the kind of creaturely existence fit to worship the exalted son at his return. For he is bodily raised from the dead and his body is perfected everlastingly that he might be a great high priest representing us to the father as a priest in the order of Melchizedek. Now, there's a lot more to say here, uh, particularly because we've constructed a body without considering uh, what for the choosing self is the central ingredient, me. And that's where I will endeavour to finish today. We followed followed through to Christ as the head over the body because of the way that uh, Colossians uh, orders him as the one in whom all things hold together, the head of all things and the head of the body, firstborn over all creation and the firstborn from among the dead. But tomorrow we need to consider the question that I've been asking for the whole week. What happens when God's choice of Jesus confronts the choosing self? Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, David, for that rich uh, reflection and presentation on uh, the, the, the work of the Spirit, uh, Pentecost, uh, Ascension, and uh, particularly in the church. I'm, I um, was personally grateful for your thoughtful reflections on uh, pneumatology and identity in the church, and uh, especially eschatolo- eschatological reflections therein. Um, we do have a bunch of really good questions, uh, and so I might turn to them. Um, if you do have questions or you're formulating them now, do head over to the Slido link, add your question there, and I'll uh, see that up on my uh, phone. Uh, David, why don't we uh, begin with the following question from Charles Taylor. <laughs> Is the choosing self a timeless theological concept or modern historical development? Is it a timeless theological concept? or modern historical development. You connect it specifically with capitalism, um, but also a theology of envy. Well, uh, Professor Taylor, I'm glad you joined us. I was expecting to hear from you at least once uh, over the course of this week. The choosing self, as I have described it, is a modern phenomenon. Uh, It is, uh, as I said last Thursday, uh, the modern identity seeking to uh, hold together uh, an identity which is otherwise fragmenting, as uh, Buckleth Harvell commented uh, in response to his his views on the uh, 20th century. Uh, So from that point of view, because it is a a modern phenomenon, uh, and I've tried to uh, vary my description from Taylor's uh, description of expressive individualism, uh, which I also interacted with uh, last Thursday. To theologically contextualise this phenomena of the choosing self, that's why uh, we went into the long story of envy. Uh, Capitalism and, uh, well, the contemporary culture in general thrives on envy, whether it... uh, as we saw earlier, whether it uh, claims to be Marxist or capitalist in its economic outlook. What I was trying to show on Tuesday is that at the heart of this is a fundamental envy of towards God's choice of Jesus uh, as his Lord and Messiah. Thank you, David. I'll choose another question, and uh, it is as follows. David... Could you talk more about identity stroke personhood being collective or communal rather than individual? So collective, communal, choosing self. 
Uh, well, I, I really want to uh, talk about that more tomorrow when we get to the business end of uh, God confronting the individual choosing self with Jesus the Christ. Uh, but for now, I'll say that uh, I think what the promise that God gives, uh, and it is an eschatological promise uh, in the picture of the church as the body of Christ, is a context in which, as I uh, suggested, individuals have their personhood, their identity, as a consequence of mutually constitutive relationships, so that they give and receive uh, from one another in the power of the Spirit and through Christ, uh, they are free to be who Christ has made them for one another, with one another. And the dynamic of, of that is that we mature together, as uh, Paul says in a number of places, we mature together in Christ as we give and receive freedom from one another to be Christ-like together in the power of his Spirit. That's what I take is the form of divine life that's being uh, reflected uh, in the church as the body of Christ. Uh, David, this one uh, may re relate a little bit to that uh, uh, previous answer, um, but I'll read this one slowly. Uh, it may also relate to tomorrow's lecture. Um, does, this is from Leo XIII, by the way, does Protestantism suffer from a lack of a clear systematic social teaching leading to naivety about political creeds and how they might impinge on the church. So, uh, Protestantism, lacking social teaching, perhaps naivety about political creeds, impinging on the church. That's a very long question, uh, and it feels very loaded. I'm going to say no. Uh, however... Uh, where Protestantism uh, is overly focused on the eschatological nature of the promise of uh, being the people of God in Christ via the Spirit, uh, and where that apocalyptic focus results in the main thing being the only thing, uh, we get instances whereby in our local manifestations of the body of Christ, there are three gifts of the Spirit preaching evangelism and going on a roster. And I think that's evidence of where uh, the eschatological aspect of being embodied together in the spirit for Christ undermines our ability to relate more generally in uh, the political context. Uh, and what I have noticed, uh, for example, uh, one strong strain of argument seemed to be in the recent plebiscite uh, in the definition of marriage. Protestants ended up relying on what seemed to me to be a far more Roman Catholic approach to natural law uh, with an addition of utilitarianism. Uh, and I think that uh, in that, what I perceived in that particular instance was a case of uh, Protestantism being undermined uh, in its ability to relate to a larger culture uh, because of its particular focus uh, on eschatological promises. Nevertheless, when the church acts as the body of Christ, gathered around the spirit and reflects the constitutive nature that I've spoken about today that comes from God's word, the church is itself a political entity that is a protest against all forms of society that otherwise exist in the world. When God's people live out the promises of God together, constituted in the spirit in the way that uh, the New Testament describes, they are themselves a protest movement against the world in which they find themselves because they are living towards a kingdom that is to come, that has been achieved in Christ Jesus the Lord, but is yet to be perfected in the power of his spirit. David is up for one more, so I'll choose one more question. And uh, we've sort of talked to, you know, around the ecclesial domain. Let's bring these things back uh, to the kind of Trinitarian core that you started with. Uh, David, is the father the father of the spirit as much as he is the father of the son? 
and perhaps you might want to elaborate on uh, why or why not. Well, <laughs> we use the language of Father and Son and Spirit as it is given to us in Scripture. And so the Scriptures, Jesus himself refers to God as Father and himself as the Son of the Father. And he does that in the power of the Spirit because the long story of sonship, as I have described in a couple of, uh, a couple of days, is the father designating his son in the power of the spirit to be the son. So the spirit and the son both come from the father, the son begotten, the spirit aspirated or spirated, and that uh, action of the father is united and concurrent. So the spirit is the spirit of the father and the son is the son of the father, the Son is the Son of the Father in the Spirit, and in the Spirit, the Father is the Father of the Son. I'm going to throw one question out there. D David, if I was watching this, and I was uh, new to some of, uh, thinking about some of these Trinitarian relations, and what would you recommend to read as, an, as a good introductory window into thinking about the Trinity? This, this is a bit Mark and Angie question. I hope you don't mind it. I do, because <laughs> as soon as Mark asked me that question, I thought of a, a, a basic text that I uh, use in one of my courses, and now I can't remember the <laughs> name of the author. So uh, uh, if you're interested, put your, put your question in the stiletto thing or whatever it's called, and, and, I'll, uh, and I'll pass the answer on. Fantastic. All right, I think that is a, a fantastic way to end this lecture. A bit of humour after reflecting on weighty and important things. And I'm very grateful, David, for you and your thoughtfulness in answering those questions on the spot and indeed uh, uh, the previous day's worth of um, effort to supply us with these excellent lectures. Uh, we're finished for today's session. We pick it up tomorrow for the final uh, lecture where David will bring a number of things together and uh, we will conclude this year's annual Moore College Lectures. I hope you've been enjoying them as much as I have, and David likewise. Um, if you're a student, your lectures will resume uh, probably around a uh, quarter past 11, uh, and, uh, and you can go from there. But as we uh, finish today, why don't I lead us in prayer? I thought a good prayer would be uh, the Collect for Pentecost, which I've slightly modified, and we can conclude as I lead us in that prayer. Almighty God, who taught the hearts of your faithful people by sending to them the light of your Holy Spirit, grant to us by the same Spirit to have a right judgment in all things and always to rejoice in his holy comfort through the merits of Christ Jesus, our Saviour, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.